Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session on what we've called activist philanthropy. So just to frame the issue for you, I want you to kind of think of giving in two different ways. One would be passive money, which I would say is historic check writing philanthropy, gala attendance, someone asks you for money and you write a check. Uh, the second would be active money. And active money demands accountability and seeks impact and struggles oftentimes with how to define the same. There are today 1.6 million nonprofits in the United States. Were that to occur in any other for-profit industry, you would see a wave of M&A activity sweep through the space to consolidate and generate efficiencies. But we don't see that, and some of the, some of the need is geographically specific. A museum, a hospital serves a community. Uh, some which target more grand initiatives, like cancer, um, really know no boundary. So we have some four innovators up here who have done very interesting things with their philanthropy. And then as we listen to their stories, I want you to focus on four different themes. One is the wake of philanthropy. I think people often think because it's well-intentioned that nothing bad ever happens from philanthropic dollars, and that's not true. If you're so singly focused on curing one thing, for example, a disease in a poor country, but you've done nothing to create an economy that allows those people you've kept alive to be participative, right? You've kind of traded one problem for another. And oftentimes those governments in small countries, particularly on the African continent with the advances in HIV, are actually struggling with that. Because as the cost of the antiretrovirals have come down, it isn't as though the budgets of these countries necessarily increased. The second thing I want you to think about is scale. So in that 1.6 million, since the 1970s, about 300,000 organizations have been created. A scant few, less than 300, have ever achieved $50 million in revenue. So fighting monumental problems with very little money, and then they never get the economies of scale that a larger organization might benefit from because they're small and struggling. The, the third thing I want to focus on is talent. When you think about the philanthropic space, the most vexing issues on the planet are tossed over there. Cure cancer, fix education, and cure AIDS. You know, these things are tossed into the philanthropic space where then the way we evaluate them is by how little money they spend on their talent. So if you're trying to get the best minds and most active people that have something to say and do, you can't really go out to the marketplace and try and get them as cheaply as possible. But that is kind of the phenomenon. I want to talk about metrics and how we evaluate those types of things. And then the last thing I want to talk about is revamping the idea of me just giving you money. So this idea of recyclability of capital, it shouldn't only be unidirectional, that checks get written and then we hope and pray that the best things happen with our intention. But in fact, there are a number of innovative financial structures that actually seek to get that capital back and then it's able to be used again and again and again. And that redeployment is something that uh, is pretty impactful. So with that as kind of the backdrop of, of our discussion, um, I want to also talk about the parties that you're serving and how you engage them. You know, oftentimes people take the grand vision of doing something philanthropic uh, without really understanding who the participants and constituents are. And I want to turn first to you, Linda, because I think you, in, in targeting the, the enormous work that you've done in the Central Valley and Lost Hills in particular, you first, before you, you wrote a check or, or put a brick in the ground, uh, went out to that community. And I want to understand like, how that process unfolded, what you learned by doing so, and how it informed what, what you ultimately did. Well, six and a half years ago, um, I still have my day job. I do all the marketing for the wonderful company worldwide. But um, I decided that instead of just writing checks, um, that I really wanted to get involved and use my business acumen to solve problems. And I did an extensive research uh, of many different places that I wanted to put my efforts. And I decided on the Central Valley of California, which many of you have never heard of, I think. Um, it is where a half to two thirds of all the vegetables and fruits in America are grown and nuts. And um, you've heard about us because of the drought, but we have other virtues. And so we have 4,000 employees in the Central Valley, and their extended families are 12,000. 
And I thought that I would start small because I had no idea what I was doing. I know business, but I have no idea about giving and philanthropy. You know, we always wrote checks. Now, Michael didn't get the memo uh, about that I wasn't writing checks anymore, unfortunately. That's Mike Milken. <laughs> but be that as it may, um, I started in a small village called Lost Hills. And um, we did extensive uh, focus groups to find out what the people needed. And then we did a house-to-house -house survey to every single home to interview at length 30 or 40 minutes each person in that community. And from that knowledge, we started rebuilding that community, which we have done today. Uh, but that was only the tip of the iceberg. Lost Hills is just the tip. And now we are in uh, many counties in the Central Valley. We impact the lives of 55,000 children in education. And uh, we also give free medical care to 12,000 people, uh, as well as health coaches. You know, we have doctors and nurses and, and uh, psychologists and every service. So what we're trying to do, what Stuart and I are trying to do in the Central Valley is do it all. Take a forgotten community that is 90 to 98 percent Latino and rebuild their lives, giving them every service and hope that they can possibly have. And the results are staggering. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And I think tell them there wasn't even a place for them to vote, right? Yes, the first uh, polling booth in Lost Hills. And, and we, we uh, have hired two interns that go around the Central Valley teaching uh, the issues about voting. And people cry. I mean, we have pictures. Emily's here. She runs our foundation. We have pictures. Pictures of people sobbing because it's the first time in their lives they could ever vote. Now, they could have before, but it was so complicated. And if you don't speak English, it's hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just, uh, education is such a, a challenging space. And over the years, I've had a lot of people that wanted to fix it and throw money at it. And people, they get dissuaded because once you start, the complexity of the issue with governments and unions, et cetera, becomes almost overwhelming. So, George, I want to focus on you for a second on Say Yes to Education because you similarly encountered that. Uh, obstacle, but we're able to kind of get over it and do it in the communities you try. So talk a little bit about Say Yes. Sure. Uh, thank you, Rich. The, uh, what's kind of interesting, Say Yes is uh, next year is going to celebrate its 30th anniversary. And what we've done over the years is we've changed, you know, the model and we've made the model better and better. And about seven, eight years ago, we adopted a holistic approach. We really partner with cities. And it's very comprehensive. Right now, we have Buffalo and Syracuse, New York, Guilford County, North Carolina. And we're about to take on two other cities. And it's a very interesting approach. The first thing that we do is anybody that has a kid in the public school system, we give them free legal aid. The, uh, we then looked at studies and found that 24.8% of these kids from the worst part of the inner city have mental health issues. So we put mental health clinics in every school. We put in health clinics around the area. We renegotiate all the union contracts because people have to work together. One of the criteria, people have to put aside, the, if, if you don't mind the term, the political bullshit to work together to help the kids. The, uh, then we hire a social worker for every school. And in Syracuse and Onondaga County, they've determined that there was a drop in 43% in foster care placements because wow. our social workers are intervening in the families at an appropriate time. We put in a student monitoring system, which is really so simple, but in the inner cities, they do not have student monitoring system. How the kid is doing, what are the issues at home, what are the parental or parent issues or parental issues, and they don't want it because they don't want the truth known about their statistics. Right. So the, uh, then in addition, we do the after-school programs, the summer school programs, and then very key is we take over the guidance counseling function, okay, at the end of their sophomore year. And I'm proud to say we have 100 private colleges standing with us to offer our kids free tuition. So what that does is gives the community hope. It gives them the ability to stand on their feet. And those 100 colleges include all the Ivy League schools, Stanford, USC, Rice, Duke, Vanderbilt, Notre Dame, Georgetown, George Washington, MIT, some really great colleges. And the thing that we require of the colleges is to mentor and monitor our kids because everybody talks about the college matriculation rate. I don't care, I could care less about the matriculation rate. I want to make sure my kids graduate. 
And the data we've seen is we've had almost 90% of our kids <laughs> staying at the college when they start there because they're getting that extra attention. That's great. So I think, <laughs> I think one of the, the important things you said is you're, you're giving hope to people. And, and that is, is one of the gifts that philanthropists can do through their giving that sometimes is unmeasured, but really is the catalyst for people's lives. And, and Precious, you, you've joined us um, all the way from South Africa. Thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> and in a country that was so afflicted by HIV for years and years and now coming out of it, um, why don't you talk about the, the power of education both in your own life and, and as you grew up, and then also uh, what you've done, particularly in the space with women. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's um, always delightful to um, have an opportunity to engage on the role that philanthropy can have um, in advancing social good as well as um, making the world a better place for all of us. Um, my husband and I, uh, started with our philanthropy um, by joining the Giving Pledge. We were inspired by um, some of the American great business people, Warren Buffett, Bill and Melinda Gates, um, who encouraged families um, who um, had some wealth to share it with the poor. So we decided to join the Giving Pledge in um, 2013. And the reason we did it is because we felt that um, throughout our lives, um, our successes, um, where we are as a family, um, we've had a lot of people contributing to, to us, our, our own success. And it was then um, important for us to give back to our communities. Um, we recognize and um, we acknowledge the fact that our well-being and our success in South Africa, which is a country that you know, um, 20 years ago was a completely different country with uh, the apartheid system. Um, and, and we realized for our well-being and success is intricately linked to the well-being and success of the poor people in South Africa. And, and that was one of our driving force for joining the Giving, the giving Pledge. Um, you talked about my education. <laughs> when I tell my children, I've got three boys, um, three wonderful kids, that um, when I was younger, and I came from a family that uh, was a professional mom and dad, five children, and um, it wasn't always easy for them to be able to take all of us to school, you know, beginning of the year. And I remember one year when I couldn't start school with, when everybody started school because my parents didn't have enough money to send all of us to school. And through the help of a community doctor who then um, loaned my family very, very little money, uh, I was able to buy um, school uniforms, school books, and join the other kids at school. Um, it is those small little um, assistance from ordinary people that tend to make a huge difference. Um, it, it's not about the very wealthy billionaires giving away their wealth, but it's also from the small people that really make a difference in our lives. So um, from my own um, experience, I know that when we support the programs that we support, hopefully we will be able to inspire some young people in South Africa, on the African continent, to also think of how they can live, um, leave this world a better place whilst they're, in, whilst they're still young, you know, instead of leaving it until they are very old. So, um, Patrice and I decided that the programs that we would support would be in education, which was very key. Um, you know, one of our greatest leaders in South Africa used to say that um, education is a key that opens many doors. That was Mr. Nelson Mandela. And of course, it has done that for us. So we support students in South Africa um, who want to study STEM fields. Um, we particularly focus on students from poor rural communities who are academically inclined and have financial need. Um, we, we pay for all their fees. We give them um, a bursary, not a loan. What we expect from them is that, um, particularly in the STEM fields, hmm. that they will be able to come back to South Africa and Africa and contribute to us economic development on the continent. We need, we need medical doctors. I'm a doctor by training. 
We need medical doctors, we need scientists, we need engineers, people who will help the continent in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of creating health systems that will help us um, to um, anticipate the next um, Ebola virus outbreaks um, and contain those. Uh, we need people who will be able to capture data and keep information so we will be able to um, uh, fast track and um, combat disease. So um, our education program is uh, one that I'm particularly very proud of. We support students. Um, South Africa is a is a has a population of about 50 million people, and we have um, about 27 universities that uh, some of them are, you know, some of the best in the world. We have um, universities in technology, and some of our students have participated in programs like um, uh, competing in uh, global inter-university competitions on, um, um, you know, it's biodiesel-fueled uh, lawnmowers, or um, one has produced uh, underwear that um, actually helps healing after circumcision. So it's really important um, medical advances and technologies that are relevant for our context uh, in South Africa. Thank you. Mm. And I think there's, there's giving that changes systems and, there, and there's giving that changes lives. A very small gift enabled you to become a doctor and now at this point in your life join the Giving Pledge and give back so significantly. Um, so speaking of more systemic change, uh, Sean, um, you have recently announced um, a, a very significant gift through the Parker Foundation where you have catalyzed a movement Amazing. around cancer, forcing the sharing of data and collaboration amongst top uh, universities and hospitals. Uh, tell us how that process went for you, what, what catalyzed the idea in your mind, and then what were the learnings that you took away from the process? Uh, so I'd been, I'd been very focused on the, on the potential of the immune system uh, to play a role um, in treating cancer, in the, the ability to potentially hack the immune system and leverage, <clears throat> leverage its capabilities in ways that maybe it wasn't originally designed to be used, um, and also unleash the power of the immune system uh, with treatments like immune checkpoint blockade uh, so that the immune system can recognize and destroy cancer. And this is, this is a field of study which you know, goes back literally 100 years, um, has been, uh, you know, full of promise, but fraught with all sorts of um, perils along the way. Um, about 30 years ago, uh, it looked like immunotherapy was going to be uh, the next major wave in, in, in treating cancer. Um, and unfortunately, due to a variety of setbacks, never really fulfilled its promise. So I, I, had, I had been very interested in the field for a long time, uh, since even before I was uh, successful as a consumer internet entrepreneur, um, and had been following its progress and really puzzled by the fact that the, the field just hadn't been particularly well capitalized. So with you know, four billion or so, uh, now five billion luckily, being, being spent by the NCI, uh, a very tiny percentage of that was going to cancer immunology. I mean, we're talking 40 to 60 million a year and that's, and that's a generous estimate. Um, so there was a systematic failure to invest in what was a, uh, ultimately, a, uh, a platform technology that's applicable to treating potentially all cancers that just just wasn't receiving enough funding, and that was that was sort of my launching my my launching off point. Um, but I, as I became more involved in funding cancer, specifically cancer immunology, I started to realize that there were a lot of um, systematic problems with the way uh, medical research in general, but specifically cancer research, was being conducted, and. Uh, in particular, and we all sort of know this and talk about it a lot, collaboration and data sharing, as much as everybody talks about and recognizes the importance of, of those two themes, um, just wasn't happening. And it wasn't uh, because there were practical, bureaucratic, administrative, cultural barriers that were preventing uh, collaboration from happening across many different centers. So kind of sk skipping to you know, the, the end of, 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 of this kind of process of exploration that I went through, um, you know, we, we recently announced, uh, my foundation recently announced a $250 million gift um, specific to the field of cancer immunology uh, that unifies the programs in cancer immunology across six 
of uh, the largest cancer centers in the world. In fact, the two largest cancer centers, MD Anderson and Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, were, were two of our initial partners. In addition to that, Stanford, um, UCLA, uh, UCSF, and Penn Medicine. So within, within this network that we've created, this consortium, um, one breakthrough that's developed at one center is immediately available to researchers um, at any of the centers. Um, data sharing. Which I was there yeah. for a second, because I, I think that I'm not sure everyone understands that that doesn't typically happen. When people think about giving money to research on cancer, I, there's an assumption that everyone's trying to work together, but I think that this idea of mm -hmm. forced collaboration is very novel and not part of the norm. You know, what's interesting is I think everyone does want to work together. You know, sci scientists do want to collaborate, even though the incentives are not set up in such a way to encourage collaboration or to make it easy. They, there is all sorts of collaborations that happen between scientists across sites all the time. But at an institutional level, between like a, you know, a, a Stanford and a Penn Medicine, um, collaboration is, I wouldn't say discouraged, but, but it's, it's, made, it's made very difficult because of the bureaucratic boundaries that are set up. And financial ones. And, and financial ones. I mean, the, the incentive system around um, academic science, uh, you know, has to do with you know getting published, getting grant money, mm -hmm. and then getting published again. And it, it doesn't necessarily align incentives between patients who need translational therapies and need those therapies commercialized so that they can become available, um, and the scientists, and then the the folks writing grants. Uh, so there, there's, there are very different incentives for each sort of player in the ecosystem. And trying to diagnose the problem of how these incentives are, are, are messed up um, actually turns out to be an incredibly complex challenge in and of itself. Mm -hmm. okay. Rich, can I interject yes. something Please, here? The, uh, Sean, I really want to compliment you because I think what you've done here is something transformative. I happen to be a trustee at Penn but also on the board of Penn Medicine, so I was very involved okay, in the negotiations. And this is really where medicine has to go. Because you know, one of the things that I've told Rich is one of my big issues is the waste in medical philanthropy. People give money to their alma mater, they give monies to their local hospital as opposed, or a grateful patient as opposed to who's doing the best research. And when you selected these, these uh, academic centers and are forcing them to work together and breaking down all the obstacles, and I know the obstacles as you know, I just, I just want to commend you. It's a phenomenal thing you've done. Thank Great. you. <clears throat> and, and I need to thank you for signing our deal. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Yeah. Well, I went through a lot of pens. <laughs> yeah. So I want to move to uh, back to Linda for a moment and, and talk about, because you mentioned at the beginning that you still have a day job, right? You yes, marketing. I do. Right. You're wonderful. Um, yeah. You have a, a program inside your company around corporate philanthropy that engages all of your employees. And, and I think from a retention perspective, from a value system to the world about what Wonderful stands for, uh, more, more companies need to do that. So please explain what that's about. And by the way, Wonderful is Fiji water and it's palm, uh, wonderful, you know, the pomegranate <laughs> juice and pistachios, um, wonderful pistachios and almonds, um, among other uh, food companies. Everything is good and good for you. So that's why we're called Wonderful. That's why she runs marketing. <laughs> that's why I run marketing. Yes, exactly. Uh, so we have something called Wonderful Giving that we started. How long ago did we start it, 2006. 2006. Okay. And what we do is we give everyone that works for us $1,000 a year to give to the charity of their choice. It, not Uncle Harry's hip replacement. It has to be uh, a real charity. Uh, and the reason we did this is we wanted uh, our employees to feel what it's like to give back. But we also know that they know what's going on in their community in a way that we could never know. And our giving, even though we do other things, um, and we do write checks, you know, to Caltech and to uh, UCLA and so forth and LACMA. But our real passion is, is to give to local communities. And so we uh, encourage people to give that money to the local community. And then we do matching funds up to about $15,000 a year. And we get 98% to 99% uh, of the people doing it. And, and we do other things as well. Every, every company goes out and spends at least a day or two in the field with Habitat for Humanity or repainting all the buildings in a small town, you know, that sort of thing. So the idea of philanthropy is, in, it, it is in the DNA of the wonderful company, mm -hmm. um, certainly, yes. 
and I think it does catalyze people to think about giving in a different way for yes. their own, whatever they can give. It doesn't have to be as monumental as a significant gift, but all the giving in the aggregate means something. Uh, but once the check goes out the door, I think it's often hard, other than hoping and praying what you want to happen, um, to really establish metrics of accountability. And sometimes people feel it's distasteful to do so. Like if I'm giving a gift. <laughs> I've heard that right? from Does it charities that asked us to invest in them. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how do you think about efficacy metrics in giving money? I think it's money? imperative, okay? Everything we do, our education initiatives are followed by Harvard. And... Um, our results are staggering. I mean, after only really four years in this deep education uh, world that we're living, 80% um, of our kids stay in college. We give sco college scholarships to every uh, child that graduates from our charter school as long as they meet a certain requirement, 100% go to college. And then we have the, our, our employees' children um, we follow them from middle school all the way through uh, college. And 100% of them go to college as well, and about 80% go to a four-year, which was absolutely, it's unheard of in the Central Valley. And more amazing is that 80% are staying in college, which is really impressive mm -hmm. after such a short time, Absolutely. because we don't leave them alone. I mean, we have homework. <laughs> Every day we have tutoring. Uh, we have community meetings with with the other kids in college and so forth, so that they know that they're protected. Because, as you all know, in education, one little thing, one phone call from mom crying because something happened, abuse in the house, they're out of there. And so we have to be counselor and best friend to these kids as they work their way through high school and college mm -hmm. so and that they stay. Looking at it through that multifaceted lens, as George explained, even the guidance counselors, right, everyone participates. Yes. But this, this idea of, of... And we're working through the public school system primarily. Oh. We just have our one charter school and two preschools, but primarily we work through the public school system. Sure. Yeah. So, so on the idea of efficacy, Sean, I want to go, barring a cure for cancer or, or, or some remarkable breakthroughs in immunology, what metrics for success are you going to use to know that it's working? If, if curing cancer was just about money, it'd be cured, right? Because mm -hmm. there's so much money been thrown at it over decades. But what, how are you going to approach, what does success mean if not a cure? Well, I mean, with a disease as complex and multifaceted as, as cancer, I mean, we, there, it, cancer, as we know, is many diseases based on not just tissue type, but, but uh, you know, the specific oncogenic drivers of, of your cancer. Um, and so, so success, success does look like uh, taking down a, a series of cancers one by one. I mean, you look at uh, cancer immunology, it's been incredibly successful in melanoma mm -hmm. with immune checkpoint blockade. Um, you know, work originated at MD Anderson by Jim Allison as our center director there, um, and in, in blood cancers, uh, be, uh, using uh, techniques like cell therapy, um, and, you know, genetically modified T cells that are essentially science fiction. I mean, they're, they're stranger than fiction, is where you're taking T cells out of a patient's body, you're genetically modifying them, turning them into cancer-killing assassins, and then making a clone army of those T cells and literally putting them back into the patient where they go to war. So su success, uh, success in this field does look like um, turning, turning many cancers one after another from death sentences into manageable, treatable diseases. Um, uh, but I, I think more broadly, the question you're getting at about, about metrics, um, I, 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 tend to, I tend to flip that on its head uh, and, and say that the most important thing in philanthropy is being open to failure. Mm. So setting yourself up in such a way, uh, just like you would with a business. Uh, businesses, you know, they, they don't have unlimited time, they don't have unlimited runway, they don't have unlimited resources, in particular startup businesses, um, you know, entrepreneurial companies. And, and, you know, so you're not, you don't have the you don't have the luxury to fund something and then continue to raise money from other people indefinitely. You've, you know, the, the, there's a bottom line. And, and you know, that's one of the major differences between philanthropic endeavors and businesses. It's, it's, much, le it's much harder to, uh, to uh, understand and, and deal with the bottom line in a philanthropic endeavor. So the more we can sort of think about uh, you know, philanthropic enterprises the way we think about businesses, and, and the more we can open ourselves to the idea that they're not all going to work, We've got, to be, we've got to set them up in such a way that we're capable of recognizing when they failed and moving on. 
I, I think when, when you approach a gift, uh, you are giving to an organization and you have one of two options. You either create a cycle of dependency or a cycle of self-sufficiency. So, and, and I think people need to really think of that at the inception of their giving. I always encourage people to pick a time frame within which you're going to stop funding. Because if it's a good enough idea, other capital will be drawn to exactly. it, and you won't have to. But if you don't do that, then the organization becomes disproportionately dependent uh, on you. Yes. So, so, Precious, I want to move to the African continent generally. So issues like the oppression of women, et cetera, and, and you're looking at, in a granular way, at economic empowerment of women as, as part of that solution. So talk to us a little about that work, and then back to the same question. How do you know it's working, and, and what, when do you stop? Yeah. <clears throat> So um, one of the things that I enjoy doing when I'm back home is watching American television. Um, it's very entertaining. If it's not the politics, it's <laughs> like real entertainment. So <laughs> I watch um, it for the politics, but also business. Um, and I know there's, um, there's a very nice soundbite I always catch. I think it's on MSNBC. And um, it's, it's um, one of the leaders, he must have been a governor of some state, and he, he says something like, um, one of the biggest social programs in America is spelled J-O-B. It's one of my favorite, because that's what our, f um, our foundation seeks to do in terms of job creation in South Africa. We have... Um, a very huge population of young people. Um, and unfortunately, 40% and above of, you know, more than 40% of these are unemployed. We have um, a huge population of women who do not have jobs and do not have a sustainable way of, um, of living. So for us as a foundation, we look at ways we can assist these groups, youth and women in business. Um, and we use strategies not dissimilar to um, um, private equity investments when we work with these. We seek out entrepreneurs in the communities, working with leaders in the community who we know will have a high chance of success. We look at sustainability of the businesses, we look at their profitability. We go out and actually do our due diligence and assess these businesses. We look at their financial statements. We look at um, you know, their, their, their business models. And we invest in these businesses um, with an expectation that after a few years, we will move out and let the entrepreneur proceed with their business. And we can take some of the profits that come out of the business and reinvest them in the community and fund another entrepreneur. So um, we, 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 we support um, youth-owned businesses and uh, women-owned businesses, but we also look at um, supporting particularly social entrepreneurs in the community. We have a program that we are supporting through Harvard Kennedy School, where um, we have African students that go and study um, social, entrepreneurs, uh, social entrepreneurship, um, understanding what works, what doesn't work. We do um, case studies with uh, Harvard to understand what they now, what uh, is very exciting and we're looking at is systems entrepreneurship, whereby um, a small change in the system affects industries across the board. Um, not very much unlike what you're doing um, with cancer research, um, really finding a place, a, a, you know, a long lever to, to change the system, to disrupt what has been happening in that system. So um, um, ent social entrepreneurship is, is one of the huge big areas that we're looking at. But talking about women, as you said, um, we know that uh, when you support a woman or girls in the community, there is a high likelihood that um, the health and other indices of uh, well-being become improved for that particular family, but also for the community. 
the infant mortality rates drop, um, the maternal mortality rates drop, education levels improve and increase, and, and that also result in um, um, the ability of the family to end better and therefore um, be hopefully move into the middle class and be able to, to, to sustain themselves. So um, our support of businesses, entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs is um, we look at um, the, the adage that um, you teach a man to fish, um, and that's what drives us. Sustainability is very, very important in, in the programs that we support in business. Um, in terms of exit, as I already said, it's really looking at um, three to five year programs. Um, sometimes it's be beyond because the, we're talking about small entrepreneurs who really need um, our support um, in terms of you know, uh, business support, marketing support, and I hope we can use your services in future, um, as well as um, coaching and mentoring. Mm -hmm. So George, when, when I think of your philanthropic portfolio, in addition to Say Yes and the work you've done at Penn, you are involved in orphan disease, and, and I know that that's created some frustration points for you. So maybe contrast for us the, the challenges of working kind of systemically through the school system versus what you encountered in orphan disease. But firstly, let me address your previous question. I think everybody on the stage is not somebody that just writes checks. And I think there's almost a mutually exclusive problem here because if you go into something like Linda's going into the community, you go in with your heart and soul, okay? And then you talk about sustainability. <laughs> and it's very hard, okay, when you really care about something deeply, okay, to walk away from it. So it's really hard, it's, it's almost right. mutually exclusive. It's easy enough, you cut a check, you can walk away from something. So I think there's an issue, okay, there. So your next question. All right. Let me say on that for a second. But I, so my point is that if you, if you only set up a system where financial dependence waits for the Resnicks to write a check, right, over the long term, right, that, this is that sustainability. becomes challenging this to sustain. This is a sustainability right. issue, but you also have the issue yeah, They'll always say, let that. the Resnicks do it. You know, let Sean do it. Let Precious do it. Let George Weiss do it. So let me tell you a little bit about orphan disease. So I spent uh, probably 80% of my time on philanthropy. Say yes, we indicated that we had 137,000 kids in the program. I forgot to mention, we've had 6,000 kids go to college. And the, uh, the second area, I'm working very closely in the same area with Sean on cancer research. And third, the uh, this orphan disease center, and uh, and I started this about you know six seven years ago, and a family member came down with an orphan disease, and most people in this audience don't even know what an orphan disease is. Mm -hmm. An orphan disease is you know the definition yeah. you know varies from you know person to person, but it's usually defined with 250,000 people worldwide or less, and the. Big farmer doesn't care about it because if you have 8,000 potential, you know, patients out there, it's not worth them to do the R&D. So as I toured around and I went to these different, you know, facilities around the country, and you see other, you know, kids with these different orphan diseases, your heart really goes out to them. And so I decided to set up an orphan disease center, and uh, and it, it was kind of interesting because I started out with one of these, you know, well-known, you know, scientists that didn't have a business. And so the guy, you know, was spinning his wheel. Somebody would contribute money, and he think that's money he can use to do something else. And then finally, you know, we talk about, you know, using a business, you know, acumen, as, as Linda mentioned. The, uh, and finally, I've got a scientist in there. as the dean of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Larry James says, be careful what you wish for. But I said, as a donor, that's exactly what you want. You don't want, as a donor, you don't want to do something that's just average. You want to make something great. So what he's done in a two-year period, we, we've helped now 27 orphan diseases, and most of their budgets are 100 grand or 125 grand. They don't have you know, two nickels to rub together. So what we've done is we've helped them you know, by you know, matching funds, raise money. But more importantly, okay, is Penn is organizing in you know, all gratis scientific committees to help them where their research dollars are going because so important. They, where they just flounder and they go to mm -hmm. one doctor and he says, I'm doing great research and they pour all their funds and don't get any results. So they, but then equally and, and probably more importantly, the, the, the center director is a gentleman by the name of Jim Wilson 
who's arguably probably the best uh, gene therapist science around, and he has six floors of lab space to give you an idea, and we know all how much of premium lab space is. And what he has done to date is taken on two diseases that he feels that he could solve. Now, obviously, what gene okay. therapy, uh, one is MPS1, the other, I can't, the, the, the nomenclature was too tough, so you have to forgive me, but somebody from Abu Dhabi had a kid with this issue. He met this person, he thought he could help, and they, this gentleman gave us a grant of five and a half million dollars, but the center only keeps like 800,000. The rest is a pass-through, helping organize. But now, interestingly enough, a friend of mine developed ALS, who's the president of an insurance company, and we've met, and Jim really thinks that we can make an impact on wow. ALS. Wow. So now we're organizing you know, research around ALS. So you asked, the question I believe you asked is how do you take the, some of the things that you learn from Say Yes you know, to this? And really, it's a question, okay, you know, and most of us have you know, pretty good business acumen. It's really taking that skill set, okay, whether it's accountability, okay, results, in certain areas, and I agree with Sean, okay, in the, you know, the cancer field, it's a little difficult to, to get your hands around that. In schools, you have certain, you know, metrics or metrics that you can use. Okay, high school graduation rates, da 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 da. And the, uh, the Orphan Disease Center. Okay, it's different. It's it's probably more difficult as well because you're trying to develop, you know, cures, and you could judge it by how many clinical trials evolved, okay, and how many FDA approvals you get. But as we all know, that's a long-term, <laughs> you know, plan. But the one thing that I learned in Say Yes is we had a model very much like Gene you know, Lang's initial model. We did a one-off school. And then uh, years later, I met with the former president of Columbia's Teachers College, and he said to me, George, you've got to recreate the highway. And I said, what does that mean? He said, it's all well and fine to have one off school, okay, and you've had great success in college placements and high school graduation rates. But if you get the neighborhood that doesn't think about going to college anymore and you put a five or ten schools together, okay, then you can start impacting a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we did take five schools in Harlem and these can we started them younger and younger and younger. And we learned that is one of our lessons. We started with kindergarten in Harlem. Now I have two hundred and eighty five eleventh graders with only two teenage pregnancies. Yeah. Only two teenage pregnancies. The felon rate is non-existent, right. and because you can inculcate them, you know, with you know, with different value systems, and you give them that hope that we talked about. And the uh, and what's interesting is I'm a little pen centric, as some people may know, but the uh, they're telling me, okay, that maybe 18 or 20 of our graduates are Ivy League material. Now, I happen to teach vocabulary up there, so I know there's a you know, cadre of maybe 10 or 12 kids. So it's really taking your business school, you know, uh, things that you've learned and saying, hey, what have I done? What can I do better? Okay, and then taking that same skill set and take it into orphan diseases. So, Sean, on that point, uh, you're obviously a very successful entrepreneur. What has been the most cha the challenge you were surprised most about when you started trying to give money away? <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I think to bring this kind of full circle, I, one of, one of the themes that you're talking about is actually leverage. How do you how do you get in philanthropy the same kind of leverage you get as an entrepreneur? As an entrepreneur, you're taking a you know tiny resources uh, and a and a and a limited runway, and you're doing. Uh, more, actually, John, John Doerr is a venture capitalist and a good friend of mine says the definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who does more than anybody thought possible with less than anybody thought possible. Um, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a way of thinking of, of leverage. As soon as you get into philanthropy, you realize that, um, number one, sustainability is hard, to, to your point. Uh, number two, it's, re it's really difficult to get out more than you put in. Uh, and, and so I... I I was challenged by, by this, you know, as somebody who's always taken small companies uh, with very limited investment and, and grown them into large companies in a relatively short period of time, I, I was going to have to become a much more patient person, <laughs> a, a, a much less frustrated person. Um, and, and ultimately, I didn't think that that would align my interests as a philanthropist with the patients and their families because they, 
they are rightfully impatient and frustrated because if they're dealing with a, 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 a disease that uh, in many cases will, they, you know, they, 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 there is no cure and, and they're not going to make it, um, they, they want cures yesterday. They want results yesterday. Um, they don't want to wait for a 15-year FDA approval process. They don't want to wait for the science to move forward. They, they are inherently impatient. So, so the, two, the two kind of innovations that we've tried to bring to the table, uh, and this gets at your point about what was the most challenging thing, uh, one of which was to say, well, this needs to be an evergreen model. So, so with, within our six centers, um, we, we need a, a, a model that's self-financing. So the $250 million initial grant uh, needs to generate more revenue over time. But we wanted to leave the intellectual property with the centers. So we created a concept where we administer the intellectual property across the six centers, mm -hmm. and then we take a little piece off off the top that comes back into oh, that's uh, that recyclability. That's the, exactly right. that's what we call this evergreen model, um, and that was a really challenging thing to get done. It was really hard um, because it it had, it had never really happened before between two centers, let alone six centers. Right. So when you think of kind of holistically looking at the problem. So, Linda, I want to go back to you and Lost Hills, because it's not just the school. You know, there's, like, other things that you've done to enhance this community. Like, they never had a restaurant. Now they do. They never had a yes, place to vote. Yes, but Lost Hills is just a small part right. of what but I want, you do. It really is. So I want to talk about the rest of what you do. Well, uh, in education, the real breakthrough thing that we're doing is this uh, is our career pathway. So I, I discovered about seven years ago that... Um, it, we had to train people in the ag business for three or four months before they could hit the factory floor in middle management positions. And um, that's a very costly enterprise, and it also is can be rife with failure because you may have picked the wrong person. Um, so what we're doing... Um, Children identify themselves in the eighth grade as wanting to go into a career in the new ag, which is really engineering, uh, sophisticated mechanics, CAD. It, it's all the STEM that we know about. And so um, then they go to a camp of uh, a farm of the future for that summer where they can experiment with plant science and all sorts of things to do with the new ag. We just grow tree crops, but they learn everything about agriculture at this camp. And then they join a cohort of like students in their high school. So we have seven high schools today where the students are getting um, classes taught by college professors starting in that first summer they take their first college course. By the time they graduate, they have an AA degree in the new ag, they can either come to us for a thirty-five to fifty-five thousand dollar entry-level job, which is a fortune in the Central Valley, or they can go to a four-year as a junior. And um, our first class will graduate next year, but the results are pretty staggering. I mean, these kids have a longer day, a longer year, but they're there and they're doing it and they're doing well. And um, Many colleges are working with us to take them in their junior year, but they have a full AA degree when they graduate high school. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that's business and uh, education working together to solve a problem because unemployment in the Central Valley of young youths is, hovers around 40%. It's, oh. it's really devastating. Okay. It's like it is in yeah, South Africa. Yeah. yeah. So, Precious, let's go to you. There are um, a number of nonprofit organizations, NGOs uh, in your country and around. How, how do you decide to whom to give? And, and can you share with us an experience that maybe didn't work out the way you thought it was going to? Um, yes. Um, you know, the South African NGO... Um, Cause there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. It, and it comes, again, with our history where the government 20 years ago um, did not have a social uh, support system for the majority of the people in the country, and, and therefore uh, individuals came in to bridge that gap between what government does and what um, communities need. Mm -hmm. So uh, that just resulted in a multiplicity of uh, NGOs, which to this day still exist. Um, but the strange thing is also when we made an announcement that we had joined the Giving Pledge and we would be supporting 
you know, doing programs ourselves, but also supporting NGOs in the communities. Um, I think because of the high unemployment rates in South Africa, you then ended up with uh, people in the community who started their NGOs in the hope to get funding from us and uh, you know, do some work. So it was almost like a job security program for mm -hmm. them, which is really not sustainable. Um, yes, we've had a few that have not worked out, and, and, and that's why we're very strict in terms of um, how we choose the people we work with. We have uh, 26 development forums, councils in South Africa. These are our, our advisory boards um, who live in the community with the people. Um, they could be coming from education sector, you know, uh, principal of a school, um, business people in the community, um, leaders in the community, the traditional leaders or religious leaders. Um, who advise us on who we can work with, I, you know, even starting with the students that we support at university, as well as uh, businesses that we can support. So they remain our eyes on the ground, and uh, we work very closely with them. Um, but uh, my husband and I also do numerous town halls. We go and visit communities. I mean, we spend... Uh, a number of days just going from community to community, meeting with the people to understand their needs and, um, and, and, and to see how we're doing, how we can improve our systems um, and, and work better. And I, I think that input variable is critical to get, get those constituents involved in the solution as well. And Sean, I want to shift a little bit to um, generational views of philanthropy because years ago, people you know, my age and older would really start thinking about it much later in life. And people in your in your 30s now, in this generation, seem to be engaging much sooner. Um, what do you think the, has been the catalyst for that? I mean, social media, the ability to so quickly catalyze millions of people around a specific initiative. Because I mean, it's a wonderful uh, phenomenon to see, but it's definitely noticeable that people engage much earlier in their lives. I mean, some of, some of that could just be wealth effects. I mean, the the fact that uh, yeah, young people who came up in the consumer internet, you know, t tend to accumulate wealth at a at a relatively young age. Um, I, I think that there's also a phenomenon that's very specific to Silicon Valley, where Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, who are mostly engineers like myself, or started as engineers, um, you know, they 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 have been building. Um, entertainment products, essentially, media products. Uh, in some cases, you know, I, I, like I've spent my entire career basically building products and services for teenagers. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you know, you get to a point where, where you've done that a number of times, and it's, it's, it's um, satisfying the first couple of times, and eventually you, you go uh, off in search of something that might be more meaningful. Now, because we all have this engineering or computer science background, I think we're, we tend to be attracted to um, to challenges that have an engineering component to them. Um, and you know, the, the, the greatest intellectual riddles right now, and the, and the ones that I think so many people in Silicon Valley are drawn to, are in life sciences. Um, it, there's a, you know, we're at this interesting convergence point where big data and you know, technology around diagnostics and assays and lab technology uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the traditional kind of um, basic research in life sciences are all, you know, they're all converging um, in, in a way where suddenly things that might have taken, you know, an, an entire career to research um, that might have been the subject of, of, you know, decades of study can now be figured out and understood in a matter of weeks or months, or in some cases days. So there's, there's this incredible inflection point, and I think those of us who have been close to these sort of inflection points in technology uh, see that there's something similar to this is happening in life sciences and that we're drawn to that area. But not every, not every problem is best addressed through businesses. There are a set of problems where, where building businesses is probably the, the ideal way to approach it. And then there are a set of problems like, for instance, getting you know, academic uh, scientists and industry partners to all agree to a, a standard uh, platform for collaborating. That's the sort of problem which I think is probably best addressed by philanthropy. And so, so you, we end up going in that direction. Mm -hmm. okay. So, Linda, you, you've had an extraordinary success in marketing. What advice would you give to the nonprofit space generally? Like, there's often, are, are they marketing themselves well? Are they hitting the right audiences to try and get that critical mass necessary to cure disease and fight hunger and the other things? Well, um, people that are very adept at um, 
helping others are not necessarily marketing geniuses, obviously. So uh, we do a lot of uh, pro bono work with um, various uh, concerns because it makes us happy to be able to spread their word. Um, but I do find that they often, well, they don't have a business acumen very mm -hmm. often, which is, which is hard. So that's why I always uh, want to urge business people to go into the nonprofit world because um, they can help. Mm -hmm. uh, you, all of you out there are very bright and uh, educated and understand business. If you just picked one small charity in your area to go and give advice to, it would be a fabulous thing, believe me, and they would be so grateful. They're always grateful for that kind of help. Um, they'll ask you for money as well, but <laughs> if you know that going in, you won't be hurt. <laughs> but I think that's a good point. And, and we're also seeing, that there's a recent study that if you're graduating college this year, I guess it was last year, um, you will have seven different careers over the course of your work life. Mm -hmm. Not seven different organizations, not seven different types of, seven changes in career, doing different things. And part of that is that it, the millennial view of I never want to get, I want my skill set to be what's valued, not necessarily the company for which I work. And why aren't I the president today? In two minutes, right. But, uh, but <laughs> the I think millennial view I love. What I think is, is helpful to think about, though, is people moving back and forth from the for-profit to the non-profit space over their careers. You don't necessarily need to make those decisions and stay. And if we can get that talent pool, it's back to what I spoke about earlier, there are going to be opportunities where the financial demands on people preclude them perhaps from working in the nonprofit space. Mm -hmm. And then there are other opportunities in your life when you might be able to have more flexibility. So sure, rethinking sure. talent as it's drawn into the nonprofit world. And then when we start thinking about recyclability of capital and those issues, I think it's fine to have a nonprofit intention or a philanthropic intention to be able to itself be sustaining. So we, start, we need to start thinking about more innovative financial models uh, around that. So we have just a few moments left. I wanted to thought if we could take a, a question or two from the audience for this, this panel. And if you just wait until the microphone comes to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Distinguished. You're doing amazing work, uh, improving the life of millions, probably billions of people. It's big to see such a distinguished panel. Um, I'm thrilled to see Ms. Motsebe here. Um, um, probably you all know those are the Kennedys of South Africa. Uh, Ms. Motsebe is a fashion queen and a husband self-made billionaire. And I'm thrilled that you are not just going to the fancy places, you go to the communities, you learn what's needed in South Africa, and I'm sure it means the world to those you visit because you're the idols. Everybody wants to be like you, and you own a soccer team. So tell me please, Ms. Motsebe, um, what was the biggest surprise uh, you witnessed by visiting the communities and how can we get the other big shots joining you to make South Africa and the whole world big? And the other thing, a compliment to you, uh, Madam, for the good. Uh, I think your advice to the, big, the companies, it's not just philanthropy, I think, if they help the NGOs. They make also big business because the NGOs know a lot. And I think it's wonderful that you address this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much for your kind words. Um, what was surprising for me, um, it, it was surprising and not surprising at the same time, was just uh, people assume that um, poor people are not intelligent. Um, and when you sit, when you, when you humble yourself to go into somebody's home and actually sit down with them and understand them, you'll be surprised how much you learn on how to solve problems that are within that community. So for us, um, following this model has always worked because um, poor people know what is best for them. Um, they live in the circumstances. Okay. Thank you. I, I think we're, we're out of time. I want to make sure people have an opportunity to get to lunch and avoid the herd that was yesterday. Uh, but I want to thank our esteemed panel. You're doing wonderful work. And a round of applause for all the things they're doing for the world. What a pleasure.